I lived abroad and recently came back to Russia and started to travel to the most remote of the beaten path places of the country. A month ago my channel was called a source that shows the criminal culture instead of the Russian culture, even though I never made political videos and simply continued to show you my travels. Hmm, non-political channel? I think it's about as non-political as these Russian cannons that were taken by the British after they won the Crimean War in the 1850s and brought here to my hometown of Galway in the west coast of Ireland. It's a fine example of the vestiges of Russian culture. These cannons, I think you'll, you'll agree in this setting with the war in Ukraine is day 120 of Russia's invasion of Ukraine. And Ellie from Russia took it upon herself to reply to me, my last video, I'll link it up above in the card down below in the description when I reacted to her. And uh, since she's not political, let's see what her last video actually was on her channel. Oh, American living in Russia about invasion in Ukraine. Sounds a little bit political to me. So in today's video, I'm just going to set the scene about how soft power works, especially here on YouTube, and how different governments, not just Russia, try to influence you in terms of the content that is created either by people who officially work for them or people who unofficially work for them. And I'll be reacting to this really odd decision to interview uh, someone who works for Russia Today and his views, which I think even in the Russian political spectrum are pretty extreme on a channel that's ostensibly just to do with Russian culture and traveling and all the beauty of Russia. Anyways, let's get into it. Bye, Ekali. Tsar experience. So Ellie from Russia took it upon herself to comment about my reaction video on her own community tab on her channel. And she said that some bloggers, well, it's only me who reacted to her, started to make videos explaining my point of view. So that's Ellie's point of view. I'm astonished at how due to the lack of information, a person can switch on his imagination, make up facts and fill in the gaps with his guesses. I guess she's referring to my background as a lawyer and doing logical deductions. And it's not just me. I woke up this morning and I saw this comment under the video, under the reaction video. And I think it sums up uh, what a lot of people have been wondering about our channel. And anyways, I'll read it out to you and then we'll get into the meat of today's video. So Wandering in Russia writes under my video reaction, very professionally edited camera work, including what seems to be video shot by an expensive drone, interviews with literal Russian propagandists without telling us who they work for, her odd access to the Russian special forces during conflict, the fact that she travels literally everywhere in Russia and tries to paint as nice a picture of Russia as possible, all while running a YouTube channel of only 300,000 subscribers with a job as a coordinator of a Russian-speaking club for foreigners. Combine that with what you've said in this video and I can come up with only one conclusion. Yes, something is weird about her channel. Exactly what that is, I don't know. I've unsubbed from her. The interview she did with the American Works for RT without mentioning even once that he works for RT made me question everything I've seen on her channel before. If you think it's just my imagination, Ellie, and it seems you other people thinking the same way. And if you like to come on and, for the record, correct how our imaginations have been running wild about why you decide to make the content that you do on your channel, invitation is open. We can have a chat about it. So maybe let me start with a quick primer on how soft power works in international relations. Basically, soft power is a way to co-opt other countries or people to your political agenda without having to coerce them. Normally hard power is known as coercion, so a clear example of coercion and hard power would be uh, Russia's invasion, current invasion since February 24th of Ukraine, we're on day 120 because, well, basically they couldn't co-opt Ukraine into staying in their sphere of influence. And um, basically soft power is when you do that without having to invade them. So like you, maybe like the European Union works on, you could say it's soft power. There's this promise of prosperity. I go into it in detail in a video made back in December before Russia invaded. I'll link it up here in the card down below in the description. And a way to influence that co-option is to do videos about how great your culture is, for example. So that doesn't necessarily only happen if it's done by an agent of the state. 
can also just be people who want to really promote a certain culture. It could be here Irish culture, for example. But also the state has an interest of doing that. America has been great at that, you know, American culture, Hollywood, uh, and people want to live the American dream. Of course, we're all aware of that, and that then puts America in a very good light, and people have this kind of, I guess, subconscious good association with the country. So, how does that work on YouTube? Well, of course, I mean, I was promoting moving to Eastern Europe in general, so you could say that's soft power, even though I'm not um, a non-state actor, we can say I'm not paid by the state of any of the countries I was promoting. And, and I don't work for them in any capacity, I also don't work for any Western agency. So I was making videos say, hey, you should come and live this great lifestyle in Ukraine, Russia, and Belarus because of these advantages, right? Uh, so you have that kind of content, you have people who do it generally, and then people who do it, you know, because they work for the state. So the video we're going to react to from Tim Kirby, Tim Kirby worked for, was on a YouTube channel called Russia Beyond, and that was affiliated with RT, Russia for Day. It was actually written on their website, and actually the channel, at least I can't access anymore, I'm not sure if Russia, uh, YouTube just deleted it or just because I'm in the European Union I can't access it, but it's Russian state media. And basically they had lots of videos about, in, in some ways, even similar to mine. Uh, just, you know, why Russian culture is interesting, the literature, um, contemporary culture in Russia, and basically promoting the country. And it's, it's, there's nothing uh, nefarious about it, except when they mix in the propaganda with it, right? So every once in a while you'd see in that channel these videos promoting the Russian arms industry. I mean, like, you know, completely out of context with the rest of the channel. And I guess the idea there is to, you know, subtly work in these um, points that the government wants to be, you know, wants to have promoted, like arms sales, for example. That's the only thing I could come up with why all of a sudden they'd have these videos about Russian armaments and guns and stuff uh, on a cultural channel. And also you can do that with political points of view. It could be a travel vlogger around and then suddenly dropping in these uh, little pieces of, you know, propaganda for the country involved. It could also be by America. It doesn't have to be necessarily Russia doing it. Uh, it can be China, it can be France, it can be Germany, it can be the United Kingdom, it could be Ireland, for example. And basically the idea is that you, the viewer has already built up a lot of trust in the person that they follow, and then they're more likely to accept to believe it kind of subtly if it's suggested by their favorite YouTuber or someone they, they watch regularly on YouTube. Now that's all fine if it's like Russia Beyond, where it's actually, they're written, you understand, if you can read that it's Russian state TV telling you this, but it's very different if it's gonna be a YouTuber that's not written, right? So, and it's just kind of like, not uh, divulges information that they're actually working for the state involved, and this is how you work in the propaganda, right? So, Ellie from Russia has a channel which would have a lot of similar videos to mine. Um, I had planned to go to Russia in 2020, but then we had COVID, and then I planned to go this year, but they decided to invade Ukraine. And basically she has all these travel vlogs about you know, doing street interviews with the people, understand Russia better, and then all of a sudden, boom, she has this very odd looking video with Tim Kirby who works for RT as the YouTuber commented, or sorry, the person commented under my YouTube video pointed out, she doesn't divulge that he works for RT and she has a lot of other subtle uh, pieces um, like being at the airport in the previous video that I reacted to uh, and suddenly she's kind of got a uh, looking at RT Russia Today t-shirts and I think there was mugs there and I just didn't even understand why they were there. They look out of place all the time. It doesn't really fit but it's, you know, it's there. You can decide yourself what you want to make out of it. So basically she brings them on as an expert. Um, not again, really sure why. It's not like she's going to then bring on uh, Navalny from interview him in his prison in Russia. Uh, he's a leading Russian opposition figure and say, hey, we have the other point of view. <laughs> no, it's only going to be uh, this Tim Kirby from RT. Um, and that's not said. So let's, I, I'll just react to just a couple of clips. I'll link the original video down below if you want to uh, watch through it. It is rather odd. I guess you could say that uh, he's the kind of guy that feels very comfortable with what's going on. Uh, I mean, he obviously decided to work for Russia Today, which is Russian state TV uh, in English. So obviously he's very comfortable with what the Russian government does. And a lot of his decision to moved to Russia apparently is because he's a member of the Russian Orthodox Church, he's not a big fan of uh, gay people and uh, whatnot, so that's kind of a, the cultural part. And um, let's just see what he says about geopolitics. Let's just pick out a few clips and then we can react to them. 
People say that uh, Ukraine, I mean the West, sent the weapons, built biolabs in Ukraine. Yeah. So that's why Russia started this. But the thing is that no one invaded Russia. Yeah. And as a Russian at school, uh, I was always taught how yeah. war is bad. We were always taught about the great patriotic war, yeah. that you never start the fight first. So why is this happening now? Oh, well, okay. And what so does Russia it's, want? It's sort of a large, complex uh, group of reasons. If you, well, one thing that I like to point out to people is that if you remember, when did all the COVID restrictions in Russia stop? So anyways, there she poses the question, why did Russia invade? I'm not really sure what Tim Kirby's qualifications are to really answer the question of the fact that he works for RT. So I guess the idea here without saying it is that this is what the Russian state believes or a certain segment of it, uh, RT, uh, the head of RT, Marg Margarita Simonyan, I think is her name. She has a very, very strident views, quite aggressive, I would say. Uh, and um, yeah, so this is who he works for. They stopped around, it was, was it January 10th or 11th, they mostly cut all that. Why? That was the day when uh, the West refused every point of Russia's offer to sort of uh, negotiate a deal about like peace between you know Russia and America and the Ukraine situation going forward. Uh, NATO rejected, or the US rejected it unilaterally, every point. <laughs> so basically what happened is Russia proposed a peace treaty where basically they asked for all these things, basically roll back the defense of Central and Eastern Europe to pre-1997, which is basically leave the countries uh, to the west of Ukraine, so like the Baltics, Poland, I think it might even go all the way up to the Czech Republic, uh, just leave them out of the Article 5 protection of NATO, right? So they should go back to before then, so that all those countries are free to invade, basically, for Russia. But the West rejected that offer. I wonder why. So it may seem like Russian aggression, but you have to understand who financed and created the Maidan that created the war in the Donbass. Well, it wasn't Russia. Russia didn't go into Kiev and was like, look guys, we're gonna pump you full of money. We are going to make your whole tribes of uh, neo-Nazis and we're gonna send you guys then to the West to uh, punish the Galicians or whatever. Then he comes up with this weird excuse about the Nazis line. The Ukrainians are Nazis. It's all funded by the West. Listen, Putin already said this when he, he admitted <laughs> that he thinks he's Peter the Great and he's on this mission, this imperial mission to conquer the territories he feels are just historical Russian lands. We don't need to talk about those. This is all the kind of pre-war, beginning of the war BS propaganda, right? So this is the line that they pumped out, blah, blah. Um, basically, it's all the West's fault. <laughs> Who invaded Ukraine? Russia invaded Ukraine. Russia's responsible. They can end the war tomorrow by leaving Ukraine and all of Ukraine back to de jure borders. But uh, the thing is different. that it was never happening on the territory of Russia. So why is Well, the problem is Russia when you look at things in a, uh, t in a historical context, most of today's Ukraine is Russia's territory. So there you go, he just says straight out, hey, we're not invading it, basically it's Russian anyways. I'm glad the English don't think about, <laughs> don't think that way, otherwise they'll be here already in my hometown of Galway again. You see what I mean? Let's just say we had the American Civil War and the South won. For all eternity, the North would always see the South as potentially being theirs. You see what I mean? And that's sort of what happened. Uh, Russia lost the Cold War, it lost a lot of its historical territory, and a lot of these territories, again, around the Ukraine region, uh, have been a part of Russia for a very, very, very long time. The territories around Russia, he means also the Baltics. The people are loyal to Russia. No, they're not. This is the source of the conflict. Again, it's a little bit to extrapolate out hard power versus soft power again. They don't want to be with Russia, that's the whole problem, because Russia isn't attractive to be with. Uh, that's why they use coercion. That's what Putin, uh, for his ambitions to become kind of like a new czar and reconquer these territories, he couldn't do it by co-option because they're not interested because Russia doesn't offer them very much attractive if they voluntarily rejoin Russia's sphere of influence. They're basically leaving to join what they think is a better option. Do you think that Ukraine as an independent country is able to choose whether it wants to join NATO or it doesn't want and it is to choose which country to align with? No, it is absolutely too weak to make a decision. If a nation uh, just really sort of exists on paper and doesn't really have the military or political force to enact, you know, power over something, then it doesn't really 
have any power, so no. So there he denies that Ukraine should be allowed to be independent of Russia. He says basically if you don't have the army, the military means uh, to enforce your decisions to be independent, then uh, you're not entitled to them. That's basically just that. That is a very realist perspective on international relations in the kind of geeky world of international relations, which I studied at Johns Hopkins University many moons ago. And you will know, hear people like Henry Kissinger and uh, John Mearsheimer, who I've also reviewed here on the channel, link the videos down below and up again in cards. They are proponents of realism. They don't believe that if you're uh, you don't have the military big enough that you should be entitled to make decisions in an independent country. It doesn't matter what the people here want. For example, let's take Ireland. Uh, as far as realists, and this is what Tim Kirby, Tim Kirby is pro uh, propagating, is that it, if UK wants to take this back, boom, Boris Johnson should just roll the tanks uh, across from Belfast down here, take it back. Ireland doesn't have a military, we don't, we're not part of NATO either, we're not even in, a, in an alliance, and just that's just the way the world should work. So what we've seen over, we'll say the last 80 years, more or less, I guess 1945, yeah, we're almost up to 80 years, is an attempt to have something different than that, because that was definitely the way the world worked when these cannons were taken from Crimea by the British, just simply about military power and the alliances that you can join, right? So uh, we've had this, developments in the Second World War and international law has basically said that you can't just invade your neighbors because they're weaker as a principle, right? And uh, countries like Ireland, well, they have rights and the UK basically can't steamroll us. Same should apply to Russia. It just can't invade Ukraine because Ukraine doesn't do what it, it wants or it just wants to have bigger territory. That's not the, world, the way the world should work anymore course in reality it's not that simple you have countries especially the big five that have a seat on the premier seat on the UN Security Council they and they have a veto there they tend to violate it Russia being one of them the others being you know some of the others being the US and um, the UK Ukraine really is just sort of along for the ride for whoever takes it basically it's a, it's a non it's essentially a non actor I believe is the proper term but a lot of countries are so they're not alone I mean, for example, let's take a country we don't talk about very much, like Portugal. Like, what if Portugal really wanted to play some sort of gamesmanship and really try to, like, act against the interests of NATO or something? It would just be crushed. So there he makes a ridiculous comparison with Portugal. I know what, maybe just pulled it out of his, his head somewhere. Portugal, what does this guy know about Portugal? <laughs> Portugal is a member of the European Union, it's part of NATO. It's obviously not going to go against NATO's interests very strongly because it doesn't have an incentive to do it. Um, but many countries that are in NATO, they do do things that, say, the U.S. doesn't like uh, or the European Union doesn't like. A good example is Hungary. Uh, and, um, yeah, Hungary has had this conflict, very conflictual relations with its neighbors and the other members of NATO and of the European Union, of, well, basically since Viktor Orban has been in power almost, which is about a decade, I guess, at this stage, or is it even longer? and no one invades them. <laughs> That's the difference. Uh, so I, I don't know, he's not really dealing with reality, he's dealing with a, an idea of the world, how the world should work from the 19th century, because that is how the world used to work, and countries invaded each other, there were empires, and they committed genocide pretty much as they pleased as well. I mean, a lot of Russian history is also based on that concept and the Russian Empire expanding. And that worldview is that it, this is how the world should work and does work is basically because Russia is an unreformed empire. It never decolonized. It had partial decolonization when the Soviet Union collapsed by consent, you know, at the beginning of the 1990s. But the mentality of many of its leaders is definitely the current leadership and definitely uh, Tim Kirby seems to be in agreement with that is like, no, it should be empires again. The irony being if everybody went back to that, to that kind of way of thinking, it wouldn't be good for Russia. <laughs> because, well, the West is a lot more powerful economically and militarily, especially from what we've seen from the world's second biggest and strongest military in the world, which is supposed to be Russia in this war with Ukraine. It doesn't look like they're that strong, even militarily, never mind economically. And it's this rejection of the idea of states acting by consent um, let's go back to Ireland. It's an example I obviously know a good bit better than this random one about Portugal. But Ireland is not in NATO, first of all, and it is in the European Union. UK is in NATO and it's not in the European Union anymore. Well, again, Ireland doesn't have a military really, and it doesn't have the protection of Article 5 of the other states that are in NATO. 
which is basically US military protection. And it does have a mutual defense clause in the European Union treaties, but really is anyone expecting France and Germany after what we see in Ukraine to come save, save them? Probably not. So um, UK doesn't invade us, even though we have a lot of political conflict at the moment about the border in Northern Ireland, UK, uh, Republic of Ireland border, uh, the thought that they're going to roll tanks across and, you know, we all speak English here, we have similar culture, we have hundreds of uh, centuries of common history, all this territory here was British historical land, if you want to make that analogy with Russia, but UK has decided that that's not how the world is going to work in general, it just isn't going to invade us militarily here. The Irish government is not scared of it. Uh, and that's also why they don't feel like they need to join NATO, for example. Though, ironically, the UK would be there as a member. So that's just not how small countries feel like they have to operate in Europe. But we live in a very different context uh, here because, you know, European Union works. Basically, this part of Europe works more or less on the idea of consent, and we don't invade our neighbors when we have a disagreement with them. Russia doesn't think like that. Why? Because it is an unreformed empire that needs decolonization if it is going to be able to live at peace with its, its neighbors. Because after this war in Ukraine, if the system doesn't change in Russia, it will do it again once it's strong enough. Words of Lynette Murray. If Russia says that it helps Ukraine in this way, why? Uh, Russia, when it has so many internal problems, uh -huh. should focus not on these problems but on Ukraine. Why sacrifice life of 146 millions of Russians who are now uh -huh. like outcasters, like they are hated uh -huh. in the world, mm, we, we can't all... go to study abroad, people lost their money. Well, that's a philosophical question whenever there's war. Why do something external when you could do something uh, internal? But again, uh, from the Kremlin's uh, point of view, the whole biolab network, the having uh, essentially an anti-Russia, as they call it, at their border that's willing to do anything. <laughs> again, he throws out the Kremlin's propaganda lineup. Biolabs! We had the forum at the beginning, the biolabs, the Nazis, NATO's expanding. All the BS excuses, Putin said it clearly. It, at the imperialism, Detka. It's just imperialism, baby. So there he calls Ukraine an anti-Russia. Well, I guess Ireland is an anti-Britain since it left it. Um, again, I don't see why they're the grounds for invasion here, but let's listen to him. Attempts to get nuclear missiles for the Ukrainians and so on and so forth. Yeah, because they would have been better off not giving up their nuclear weapons into 1994 with the Budapest Memoranda because Russia invaded them and nuclear weapons in the hands of Ukraines would have been a deterrence to that. This is all pretty standard IR. I think at some point it sort of culminated into just being something too big to ignore or to let go. Uh, you also have to remember that, okay, about the lives of all the people here. Well, there are at least 10,000, probably before the special operation or hot phase of the war started in February, there were, what, 10 to 16,000 dead bodies of Russian-speaking people uh, already underground in the Donbass. So he moves on to the other Casas Ballet that's fake, I forgot it. The genocide in Donbass. Which is, of course, made up. I actually saw um, the British journalist Rosenberg challenge uh, the Russian Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Sergei Lavrov, uh, just the other day when he said, well, in the last two years before Russia's invasion of February 24th, there were just 15 civilians killed in Donbass. Now, of course, that's tragic that those 15 people died, uh, but how does that justify a war where tens of thousands of people have been killed already? Like, it's absolutely <laughs> unbelievable to still try to use that as an excuse. And again, he seems to conflate being Russian, speaking of Russian. Again, we can make this analogy with, with Ireland. Uh, this is actually one of the most Irish-speaking areas of the country, but basically everybody here speaks English. And uh, yeah, so are we all English still? Of course not. That would be stupid to say they have a different passport, different nationality, different identity. There are some people on the island of Ireland, of course, think they have a British identity or they have a British identity. Um, but that's a small number of the English speakers and Ukraine in the last, um, uh, since 2014 in particular, since Russia's first invasion, series of invasions started, uh, the brand of Russia has really gone into the toilet and even more so with this invasion and just been, become less, less popular to identify as Russian, right? Or be kind of leaning towards Russia. So again, 
yeah, there's no sense to what he's saying there. What are you gonna do? What are you gonna do? Like, maybe become more attractive so people want to be in Russia's sphere of influence. Maybe be prosperous, maybe respect human rights, maybe respect your neighbors. Uh, maybe then you could coax them back. Invading them, not gonna work. And that's why I predicted, uh, I, well, I said in day 30 that Ru Russia's not gonna win the war, they've lost. And that's clear. I mean, Barr committing a, successfully a complete genocide of Ukrainians, uh, they're not gonna be able to control this territory afterwards. Not even the parts where people uh, speak more Russian because they hate Russians now, in particular. I mean, Russians weren't so popular beforehand because of what happened since 2014, but now, good, good luck with your channel, Ali, from Russia, if you're, gonna, if you're gonna try and convert the Ukrainians to liking Russians. Uh, so essentially, it's one of those things where uh, are you just gonna stand there and uh, let your own uh, people get killed? They're not your people. You see, this is like the Kremlin's propaganda. This is a good example. I guess this is, if you have been presented, hey, I'm inviting someone out who's going to regurgitate uh, the Kremlin's propaganda. Uh, the old excuses for the war before Putin just openly said it was imperialism. Why could, couldn't those Russians just move to Russia from Ukraine, where they were oppressed this much? Well, that's again, that's another sort of uh, these like philosophical question. So it's like, okay, so what you're saying is uh, everyone says that you can't ever use Nazi Germany as an example of something. No, Tim, you can. <laughs> you can compare uh, the invasion of Ukraine with the Nazi-Soviet joint invasion in 1939 of Poland, for example. Because it means your example is invalid? F you, you're wrong. Uh, so what if the Jews were feeling a lot of heat in the 1930s? So essentially, it's like, well, could they maybe have, I don't know, fought back? Or should they have just left and gone somewhere else? Well, maybe there's nowhere else to go. So now he tries to compare Russians and Namas to Jews. Are they walking around with yellow stars? Are they being marched off into, well, it's the 1930s, they weren't put in. Uh, gas chambers then. They were, they had their businesses burned, they were been abducted, shot, beaten up, marginalized from society. Uh, last time I checked, uh, even the Russians weren't claiming that they had to walk around with uh, uh, Stars of David uh, or identifying marks uh, when they were there in, uh, in Donbass, presumably under Russian, well, I don't know where he's even talking about. It's so ridiculous his comparison. And yes, they could have just left, the border was there if they really wanted to. The reason they didn't leave, most of them, uh, and I think you can only say that must be prior to 2014 and Russia starting the war because since 2014 you want to leave because there's a war and basically a group of thugs with guns took over and uh, started to wreck the whole economy of, the, of that region anyways. There wasn't much, re you know, weren't great prospects staying there, even more so if you were pro-Ukrainian unity. Uh, they could have just left and got across the border. Russia's there. Like, it wasn't too hard. But they didn't leave because, well, Guess what? They weren't really being oppressed at all. So this is a bullshit series of excuses. Just, it's kind of a weird interview. I don't know what the purpose was again, inviting this guy on. When does this end and how? I have absolutely no idea. I'm actually stunned that they actually did the special operation. Russia usually sort of bends over backwards and says stuff like, okay guys, let's negotiate. We have uh, common uh, universal values and no, 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 okay. <laughs> Uh, when do you hear Russia saying that? Like, think of the number of wars Russia's been involved in in the former Soviet Union since it collapsed in 1991. You had, I mean, the first years after it, okay, it's a bit different. There was obviously a lot of chaos. They were involved in Georgia, Abkhazia and South Ossetia, Moldova and Transnistria. I can't remember their involvement in Nagorno-Karabakh at the time. And then since then, invaded Georgia in 2008, invaded Ukraine in 2014, um, been involved also in Syria. Um, now we've got the 2022 invasion of Ukraine. They also threatened Moldova again. Then they're going to go all the way there and basically seize uh, Transnistria. Uh, they've been threatening uh, all the Baltic states. It's interesting. Also, I looked at my uh, Instagram this morning and uh, Ellie is with frolicking with a group of Russian sailors on the Baltic Sea in Kaliningrad. Yes, she is with the Russian Navy, but she's non-political, of course. Um, Probably, possibly there's going to be more conflict there as well. Uh, and it's, it's sort of like um, this uh, thing where it's, uh, I'm trying to think if there's a, a good movie. It's kind of like the, the wimpiest kid in class that everyone makes fun of and beats up. He's like, guys, don't hit me anymore. And then one day he just goes to school and just beats someone to death. Really? That's his analogy? Russia was being bullied? Really? Uh, I must have missed Ukraine invading Russia a few times, maybe. I don't know what they're supposed to do. Maybe 
uh, historically have committed genocide against Russia. Oh no, that was Russians against Ukrainians, or it was Soviets against Ukrainians with Stalin. But they committed their own genocide and with the Circassians that Pushkin actually idolized the big star of Russian literature. Uh, no, Russia is not the wimpy kid. I would say, if anything, it's going to be Ukraine because Russia keeps picking on it. And um, yeah, Russia is trying to beat literally Ukraine to death. That's why I did the video about the genocide in Ukraine that's taking place, not the made up genocide that Tim Kirby repeats from Russian propaganda. Well, he works for Russian propaganda, so it kind of goes with, you know, his job description. Uh, but this is a terrible analogy. We haven't lived in a multipolar world since the uh, 1800s. And even then in the 1800s, that was a very Eurocentric multipolar world, not like a multipolar world of uh, China and India being poles, right? So it's very different. We don't know where we're going. He makes these references to multipolar world. And uh, you see, he, he, he sees the world uh, in the sense of it being back in the 1800s, 19th century, were basically have imperialism and these different centers of power, right? So within Europe, obviously you had this balance of power and now he sees it with China and India and then basically having a right to behave in the same way, being imperialist powers. Uh, that kind of sums him up, but that is the Kremlin's basically policy. So you got a mixture there with Tim Kirby of, um, yeah, the standard kind of pre-Putin admitting it was just imperialism, uh, set of propaganda, Cassus Belli points, which is that, well, there's biolabs in Ukraine. <laughs> They're all Nazis. There's a genocide in Donbass, and then they go on to kill tens of thousands of Russian speakers in Donbass itself. Because think about it, what's happening in Ukraine. They are killing basically the Russian speaking Ukrainians first. They're not in Lviv killing the Ukrainian speakers. Thankfully, not killing them as well. But just think about the perversion in these people's minds. Uh, about what they're doing. And then the other thing is NATO expansion, but NATO is probably going to expand further with probably Sweden and Finland joining. They're trying to join at the moment. So again, that doesn't make any sense, but that's just a natural reaction to you invading your neighbors. Um, so yeah, so you got a mixture of those propaganda points with the real world view, which I think is, is prevailing in the Kremlin at the moment is like, yeah, they want to go back to imperialism. They don't care about, you know, if you're Irish, and as far as Russia is concerned, at some point, if you're weak, they're coming for us as well. And they think the British have already taken us, basically. Just invade, kill us if we resist. And that's the way the world should be. Yeah, so I guess if it had been presented that light, hey, I have someone from Russian state TV here. He's going to outline the Kremlin's viewpoint and Russian propaganda for you. And uh, so that you understand, you get to hear it. Uh, because they're currently, they find it hard to get their message out, then this actually would have been a pretty fair interview. The fact that that's not disclosed is kind of how this new soft power tries to work serendipitously on YouTube. I think that's all I really got to say about that. Uh, again, to Ellie, if you want to get your own message out, feel I've misrepresented, I've been using my imagination too much, or the other viewers who comment under my video have just like gone on this mad, uh, tangent away from what you really believe, just reach out to me and we can set that up. And otherwise, drop me a comment down below what you think of the video, what you think of Softbar, how it works here on YouTube, and what do you think Tim Kirby's views are valid? Is that the world you want to live in? Especially if you're from a smaller country that borders a big power like the US, UK, Russia, or if you're from one of those countries, do you want your country to become imperial again and start starting all these wars? Because it might be you been sent to fight there for the grandeur of someone like Vladimir Putin, because he does not care how many people, how many Russians are going to die, whether they're Russian speaking in Ukraine or whether they're Russian citizens themselves, or obviously he doesn't care how many Ukrainians die by and large, because he just thinks that in 10 years, 50 years, or 100 years, people are going to look at history, they're going to see this great man, and that was the great man theory of international relations, and they're going to see the color on the map. Russia is already the biggest country to wear, and they're going to have it, that color will say red for Russia and blue for Ukraine. That blue is going to disappear, and it's going to be a red dot. I mean, this is assuming that he were to be victorious, which I don't think is going to be the case. I've already said it in my other videos. And uh, people are going to think, not care about the millions of lives he's destroyed, how many, I think it's 8 million people. I saw the latest figure for the number of people who've left Ukraine as refugees. Some of them are coming back again. I think in turning displaced people, it's way higher than that. It's over 10 million. 
Um, how many people have been killed? Possibly 100,000 already. Already, and we don't know how long this war will go on for, 120 days. And what is it all for? Never mind the fact that the economy is trashed. Ellie can't really travel so much. She's going to find it hard to get a visa because she's Russian. The brand of the country she's promoting is in the toilet. Definitely in the West for sure. Might be a generation at least before there's any reconciliation between Ukraine and, and Russia uh, after the Ukrainian victory. Is that the world you want to live in? So, from the non-political canons over there, just Russian culture, do svidanya, do popachna. See you in the next video. Slava Ukraini. Sar Experience.